Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 467. That's 467 of the Agostino Zinger Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. Good to know. If it's the first time checking the show, you know what to do. Smash that like button, hit subscribe, and of course, leave me a comment down below. And of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review and a share will help the show go a long way. So don't be tight, don't be stingy. Get your little thumbs out and share the show and leave me a five-star rating. That will and truly be appreciated. I think I've seen about 12, maybe it's gonna up to about 13 by the time I end this. That'd be nice to see. Get it up, get it popping. And of course, if you want to support the Patreon, you can too at patreon.com for just Agostino. There's not a lot of content on there at the moment, but I'm upping stuff little by little. I'm gonna upload um, a review of a couple of movies that I watched over the weekend. So definitely check out those if you're that way inclined. Of course, I'll talk about movies, talk about other stuff, and just other excellent bonus footage that you won't find on this main feed, only available via the Patreon. So make sure you check that out at patreon.com for slash A G O S T I N H O. You can find the link in the show notes descriptions. Check it out, back it for as little as one pound. Um, or one dollar equivalent per month and you get access to all that bonus content available via the patreon so don't delay get involved on that today oh here we are man here we are another week we're just trucking on this should have been the day when all our freedoms in the uk were lifted and we had the possibility to kind of go back to some sort of normality this would have been the day that i would have been somewhere huddled in some corner of egg nightclub you know um with a baggie and a key you know shoveling copious amounts of ketamine into one of my nostrils this would have been one of the nights when i would have been trying to make a million friends on the dance floor and sharing my life stories with people behind the bar this would have been the day but unfortunately that's been now delayed um everyone's debaucherous activities and plans for the future have now been paused not too long don't get me wrong it's only the 19th of july but there's still that element of like liberties and just freedoms being taken away from you. And it feels as if it basically is the fact that we're basically powerless in this, isn't it? We don't have any right. We don't have any fight in this. We don't have any way of kind of going around the system of challenging the people in authority. And that's something as well that I've been kind of surprised by just from the outside looking in or just from, you know, just from being around when this is actually happening. This is obviously a moment in history. But it's just a lack of like pushback. Obviously, maybe because I'm keeping abreast with all the stuff that's happening in the US and there's been a lot more pushback and a lot more questioning of everything, right? Of the lockdown, of who needs to have the vaccine, of all these sort of things, right? A lot more questioning from people. And then, of course, you know, you've got the governors and whatnot of each individual states, um, depending on what where they stand politically. For the most part, it seems like in the US, if you're mostly a Republican, you're mostly, you know, veering on the side of like opening up everything and getting back to some sort of normality as quickly as possible. And if you're left and you're on the Democrat side of things, you're more, you know, obsessed with the science and all that sort of malarkey and trying to wait for the perfect time when things can go back to normal, which obviously there is no perfect time with this sort of like, you know, um, highly contagious respiratory virus. There's always going to be a kind of element of kind of you know uh, gambling that's going to be needed if you're going to restart the economy but regardless it seems that for the most part america split up in that way and in the uk or in the europe for the most part it seems a little bit more mixed bag in it maybe it's because of how deeply people are affected by it because if you remember if i'm not mistaken it did sort of like start in china and then it sort of hit parts of europe and obviously it destroyed certain regions in italy really really badly so maybe there's a lot of kind of ptsd and a lot of scars there and a lot of kind of pain so people are not very quick to kind of step out um in front of camera or in front of the microphone and say hey i want everything to reopen now and push that source up because you know everyone's got a family member or a friend of a friend that they know who's you know has suffered in very very dire cons dire ways don't get me wrong but then on the same thing you look at the u.s side of things if i'm not mistaken who's that guy from broadway in the u.s he was one of the kind of first high um, kind of um well-known victims right of covid some act some actor or kind of guy who unfortunately had to have like a you know i think one of his lungs got taken out he had to have his leg amputated and he eventually ended up passing away from his um of all the complications of the surgery on the virus i'm not too sure but he has he was a pretty grim case that was one of those ones where everyone sort of kind of took notice like okay if this guy is a you know uh sort of full-time actor on broadway 
it means he's on his feet most often than not working you know seven days a week doing 12 hour shifts all day rehearsing and then performing week after week after week after week you'd imagine someone like that would be you know probably the best possible shape needed in order to kind of fight this virus but it didn't it completely took him out we don't know what his previous you know things were bloody blah, blah blah don't get into it but it's just interesting how there's been a lot more pushback a lot more resistance to lockdown and stuff than there has been in europe or in the uk it's like everyone's just kind of going with it and i guess now with 19th being the new day it is what it is we kind of have to just take it on the chin and hope um that that happens there's obviously a couple of stories i'm going to read later on where they're mentioning that or allegedly the 5th of july might be the new freedom day quote unquote which is you know it's a bit of a piss ache in itself isn't it the government telling you and you're going to be free and allowed to travel and allowed to do your things and you know hug people on the dance floor and sweat next to strangers and stuff it's just so weird isn't it um and then i remember there was like a bit of what is it, a bit of a commotion on twitter over the weekend with secret dj and camel what's it what's their face called camel fat or camel toe whatever their name is those um take us that take us duo they had a little bit of a back and forth mainly due to you know where they stand ideologically in terms of the lockdown and how serious or not they're taking the virus and all that and it's just a mixed bag and it? it really is a mixed bag it's an interesting mixed bag for the most part because it does seem like the more affluent you are as a dj or the more affluent you are as a musician or an artist you tend to possibly stand on the side or you tend to kind of veer on the side of let's just open things up and get back to working or you just do what most of those guys do and you kind of fly out to zanzibar or to parts of Colombia and Puerto Rico and just kind of, you know, basically make that your temporary residence and just play on the beach, do you know what I mean? Four times a week, get paid a nice amount of money, um, get a tan, rejuvenate yourself and then come back to Europe when everything reopens again. But it feels like only the ones that have the means to obviously fly over there can do that sort of thing. Now, don't get me wrong, flying to Colombia from Europe isn't, you know, it's not as expensive as it was like, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, but it still requires a decent amount of income to kind of, you know, up sticks and go. And also, you have to imagine, not everybody gets offered those kind of gigs, right? No one, you know, the, the Ricardo Villalobos and those kind of worlds of, of the worlds, maybe he's the one that gets to play in like Zanzibar and stuff, but no one else does. So it's really interesting how that's kind of shaken down. Like, you know, the poorer the DJs they are, the more kind of quiet they are around like opening up restrictions, the more kind of pro COVID passports they are and all this sort of weird stuff. It's like, you never really think about that. You, you would think people that are on the kind of, you know on the edges of the poverty line would be a bit more open to maybe finding out some creative ways to get around this issue right or kind of making it work for themselves to so number one keep a roof over their heads and number two just kind of keep in touch with their community because i'd imagine a lot of those people especially in the lower rungs you don't really have you know outside of that community of people in dance music who else do you hang out with who else can you can, can you hang out with really logically speaking your hours are all kind of messed up. Start working in a bar, I'd imagine, right? It's hard to have like normal friends that work nine to five because when they're kind of off, you're in and all that stuff. Yeah? So you're kind of, your schedule's always a bit messed up, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but it's just been an interesting thing to kind of observe from the outside. And then it got me thinking a little bit about all the dumbness about, you know, cancellations and stuff that happened last year. And of course, one of the ones I featured on this channel, Peggy Goo versus Daniel Wang. And it got me thinking about how dumb that whole thing was last year, right? And I'm happy I kind of wasn't, you know, swayed by public opinion to kind of really rag on Peggy Goo too much, even though, you know, she probably has her um, deficiencies and things that people don't like. But for the most part, there was nothing really there, was there, thinking about it, like, it was probably one of the most embarrassing situations to be in if you're Daniel Wang, which is somebody of his kind of stature, somebody of his kind of notoriety. It was such a bizarre situation because at, at its essence, what it kind of felt like was one person just being severely jealous of the other person, right? There's just a like a deep-rooted and probably honest, not honest, a real and authentic level of jealousy. And I'm, and I'm kind of a little bit controversial that way in that, I don't think jealousy is a bad thing. I think it's pretty much a good thing to have, maybe in like small doses, maybe to motivate you, to push you in the direction of kind of working harder and doing the thing that you need. Because rarely have I found, I don't know, maybe it, other people have a different perspective on it, but in my experience, rarely have I found anybody, even somebody I don't really like what they do, have I found somebody that's just like undeserving of their success? Because you, know, you can't really be the one to judge, but it's rarely just somebody that's just been handed the keys to a kingdom and just been told to run with it and that's it you know what i mean there's some level of work that has to be done to in order to maintain it even though you might say oh they got the keys in the first place it's like the whole like 
Donald Trump $1 million loan thing, right? Cool. Maybe he didn't get just a $1 million loan and it might have been a series of millions over his entire lifetime, but he still had to work really hard. He still had to kind of put himself, you know, um, in front of people, right? And kind of be in the public conversation for the best part of what, 50 plus years. That takes a lot of work and effort to do. It's not really, you know, the easiest thing. You know, I get bored of myself when I look at some of my Instagram stories after a week. I can only imagine how those people feel going in front of, you know, going in front of cameras and saying the same line and delivering the same little zingers. It must be exhausting, but he did it again and again and again. So because of that, I think maybe you can look at someone like that. And if you ended up, you know, in your field or if she, let's say, Peggy, you end up in some field that you're really passionate about and she ended up getting really famous. I think you'd maybe look at some of the good things that she's done as a, maybe as an example, as something that you can kind of maybe add to what you're doing if you're doing everything right in your head. Um, but then I guess when jealousy goes too far is when you start kind of blaming that person who's external to you, has no influence on what you're doing for the reason why you're not where you should be, right? That's why you can kind of get a bit too dizzy. So maybe that's what happened to Danny Wang or maybe it's just, you know, him being, what, 30 plus years in the game seeing this young girl come into living in his apartment block that he lives in with that he's probably worked really hard to get that apartment he's finally there settled in and this young lady comes in who he thinks isn't that great he probably has you know a buried bit of resentment in that he hasn't really ever acknowledged and then she's living at the top floor maybe maybe she's got the top very very top floor apartment and because you know some berlin apartments have these really amazing kind of balconies that you can look out over the entire city yeah and they're really kind of nice and well kept and all that malarkey so you know that's something that he is obviously very aware of what that kind of life is up there he's probably aware of how much that person will probably end up paying if they lived above them or wherever it may be i'm just assuming for any side they might be on the same floor i don't know it's no surprise that he kind of got his you know he got his kind of panties in a twist about it really is no surprise but at the heart of it what it kind of made me think was maybe there is this kind of deep-rooted resentment that people generally do have to people that especially artists who they feel as if come from like affluent backgrounds and that might have been kind of what was underlying the whole thing because obviously this asian on asian right so there's no kind of racial element you would imagine maybe i'm not too sure if danny wang is actually is he korean as well i'm not too sure because asian people you know they're not the most kindest to each other when it comes to the other countries that they're from and stuff so who knows but for the most part i didn't get a tense of any sort of racial you know battles or whatever between them i just got the feeling that maybe he just felt as if like you know here's this kind of rich bold girl coming into berlin and realizing her dreams in super fast fashion just because she's you know pretty or because she's like a empty vessel who knows but i think it's a very much a deep-seated um hate that people tend to have and maybe it's warranted because you know most art forms are basically a avenue or a platform for you to kind of tell your story and there's nothing really compelling about telling a story where you've gone to like private boarding schools away from you know private boarding schools you've gotten kind of all your jobs lined up from you from your contacts and whatever industry that you're in there's no real you know point of reference there for most people so most people like to hear like the kind of rags to riches story right like how it's you know how you had to work two jobs to put yourself through uni and you had to save all the last money you had to go backpacking and made you introduce you to some people da, 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 da. everyone wants that kind of fantastical sort of like you know picture book or storybook sorry um um you know narrative that they can kind of attribute to their overall career and obviously peggy didn't really have that because from what we know so far you know she comes from a very you know well-off kind of family and stuff and that might have afforded her a lot of luxuries in order to kind of pursue her creative goals and endeavors and made her basically stumble into a bit a pretty much a solid um djing career that's probably going to take her you know well into her old age whenever she wants to she can use it to pivot off into doing any, every number of things so she's kind of set for life in that regard so it made me think about it and then i kind of stumbled on this article courtesy of double w double w magazine good study artists are more commonly to come from rich families which kind of made sense really if you think about it right because you know you have more time you have more resources especially i guess in the contemporary art world it is a little bit as much as they like to pretend like they're kind of um you know it's a democracy it's democratized in that way like anybody can enter through their doors you have to be a, a particular person to know that these things are even happening in terms of private views displaying your work there good luck making contacts there good luck again it's a very particular kind of socioeconomic class that kind of frequent those places but even in music right you look at something like a taylor swift all these kind of people you know for the most part you know in order to 
toil away doing kind of open mics um singing your heart out you're going to need some level or some buffer of financial aid in order to kind of make that happen most people can't do that because they have families they you know have rent to pay it's just difficult to do so so this study kind of basically says that it's very common to see that across all arts um there is a high prevalence of people who have come from affluent backgrounds but again like i like i was gonna set out here i don't necessarily think it's a bad thing i think you know the whole reason why art is so amazing is that it allows anybody and everybody to tell their story in regards to what your story is even if it is going to a private boarding school somewhere in europe and having you know flipping the sons and the daughters of queens and kings as your classmates that's still your story and it's still compelling and it's still worth telling because you know there's something that kind of binds us all it's the kind of human experience that's what you realize quite often when you go to foreign countries you don't know the language you can sometimes connect with people just through sounds and motions and pointing and all that stuff because we all go through the same things heartbreak betrayal you know success disappointment all this sort of stuff kind of attributes it's kind of part of what you go through as a human so obviously even if you're somebody that comes from an affluent background you still have struggles and pains it might not be the same as everybody else but there's still your struggles and pain to tell and art kind of allows you that free platform to kind of tell those stories so anyway this article says the following leonardo da vinci's father was a well-off okay so in the center here Leonardo da Vinci's father was a were, was a well-off uh, notary. Michelangelo's descended from a family of bankers, though they were not quite successful in the bank. Um, Edouard Manet's parents were judge, were a judge and the godfather of the Swedish prince. Since bourgeoisie backgrounds are not particularly uncommon among biographies of art histories, who's who, and according to a recent study, not much has changed. As it turns out, the wealthier your family is, the more likely you are to find yourself with a career in the arts. Right. According to Artnet News, the Danish economic professor Carol Jan Borojek dug through decades of data from the U.S. Census Bureau from his paper The Origins of Creativity, the Case um, of Arts in the United States since 1850, so 1850, and that what he found should track just about anyone who has visited Bushwick lately. For, again, a little bit judgy there, but snarky, but let's continue. For every $10,000 in additional income a family makes per year, there's a 2% increase in the chances that the child of a family will go on to identify um, their profession in the sense as an artist, actor, musician, author, or similar creative prof professional. This means someone in the family making 100000 per year is twice as likely to end up in a professional artist as somebody from a family making fifty. Again, which makes sense, right? You would just imagine coming from a working class background, living in some sort of like dilapidated hood or ghetto somewhere around the world and then trying to tell your parents that you want to paint for a living. You want to take pictures. You want to make music, right? And stuff that they think doesn't even sound good. You want to take that You want to take that seriously and make that your profession and hope you make a living from it. They're just going to be like, what? They're going to think you are smoking absolute crack. So it makes complete sense that in order to have that ability to kind of travel and do your thing and find yourself and take the time out needed in order to kind of develop your skill set and not have to worry about working you're going to need to have some level of financial backing some level of financial aid um and again that makes complete sense but it also is pretty awesome when somebody who hasn't doesn't have those um resources can also make it because you know just how much that person's had to work against before even being able to kind of you know put a paint to a flipping canvas they've had so much battles that they've had to kind of fight outside that you kind of think oh my god when they finally do step into that studio it's no wonder they create magic right because there's so much kind of pent up um creativity just waiting to kind of burst so both sides again are pretty um okay in my example or in my kind of head i don't really see an issue for you i think we can kind of coexist but it is an interesting point to make and it continues here it says of of course while those who come from a comfortable families are more likely to be exposed to art at a formative age to those who don't that doesn't mean that these arts are particularly lucrative field indeed the average income for an artist is below the american average wage which makes complete sense so any extra help from family may not only come in handy but indeed make pursuing a career uh possible in the first place we should note that uh borrow which how do you say had the, the name borrow week borrow weeks borrow 
Did I say it? Which is? I don't know. Research includes money made by any direct member of a life family, including siblings, in the year before the census. The, fa the, the factor of family income is also likely correlates with the lack of racial diversity in the field. Indeed, before 1950, non-white Americans identified themselves as, or, or to the census as working in creative fields were particularly unheard of. Even today, only 20% of self-identified professional artists, creators are non-white, which, again, big issue in one sense but also maybe a little bit overblown, especially if we look at what sort of kind of art feels that they're sort of looking at. If it's maybe contemporary art, then maybe again, um, there is a lot of kind of deep rooted issues there. But when it comes to music, especially now, how it's been sort of like the level, the playing field has been somewhat leveled. As long as you've got like a, you know, a crappy microphone and a half decent computer, you can pretty much, you know, put your kind of throw your hat in a ring, right? It's not going to sound as amazing as somebody who's produced something in like a bespoke music studio, but you can at least have the ability to kind of put your ideas onto in you know onto an MP3, right? You can basically convert it into MP3 and kind of get those kind of out there for the most part. And from what we've seen with the advent and the kind of you know proliferation of SoundCloud rappers over the last few years, there's always a willing listener ready to give you a chance. And you know, especially these days, kids are like super happy to find somebody that no one really knows about and kind of you know champion them to everybody that they know so i don't know i'm a little bit off with that one the continues here says as it turns out however more women are likely to have careers in the arts um than men indeed a woman's probability of entering the arts is 18 percent higher than those of the man's of course demographics tend to differ over the ages musicians are also likely to be both female and non-white than other professional fields whereas most whereas actors are more likely to be male interesting and it? women are most likely to be artists i wonder what that's about maybe it's just um hmm Excuse me, the news is met in our sack office with, um, with choruses of duh, but the implications do do um, have some reach. It's true that while your average artist may not be making a lot of money, it turns out that the concentration of artists in particular city can lead to a economic growth. It says the advantages of having a wealthy cultural supply and a meaningful cultural heritage nowadays are vast and non-negligible, non ranging from economic gains to tourism of inflows to non-monetary gains arising from a common entity. The study says artistic population is not spread out evenly throughout the country though artists tend to cluster in specific cities which makes sense and the presence of one particular famous artist in one's field in a city means it's a high likelihood that the city is home to another famous creative in a different discipline which is to say that a city with a particularly well-known painter is more likely to have say a world-known ballerina as well surprising unsurprisingly new york city is the home of the biggest such artistic cluster though historically san francisco boston chicago los angeles have had noble communities as well so yeah like i said obviously you know it's you we're gonna you're gonna end up with a lot of peggy goos over the years people that come from affluent backgrounds have been able to kind of find their way in whatever creative field that they want to find but again i think everyone can coexist i think the annoying part of it is when everybody at the top is from a certain background and they all kind of occupy the same spaces and then the music isn't good the programming is horrible and then people coming up underneath don't really have an opportunity to burst or to kind of get that platform either right that's usually the big problem there's not enough um there's not enough um, sharing it feels like right when it comes to uh putting people on in that regard um which is understandable too because maybe people at the top sell tickets who knows there's politics involved there but again the whole tickets thing too you're bound to the tickets thing as well i don't know whether or not it's like um especially in dance music because i remember seeing especially my friend sent me a flyer of a couple of people who haven't necessarily sold out their events you know the whole coming back from covid thing but the whole selling tickets and dance music too it's a little bit funny in it for me it's a little bit funny because i don't know for me personally i see how many times you know there's probably not a month that goes by where i don't stumble across across some clip of like you know nina kravis or deborah de luca playing somewhere right these kind of really attractive you know um dj women you know tw twiddling and twirling around behind the dj booth right there's always a video of them same goes for like a record of a low boss and svenvar exists for men as well right and those videos get shared very you know a lot right and they rack up millions of views they rack up millions of likes and comments across different accounts so it's not it's not kind of a surprise when those people then go and put on a show and it sells out because everyone just wants to go and see this thing that they keep seeing on their social media feed obviously it helps if they finally go to see you so you're good but i'd i'd be 
I'd be very wary of saying that that kind of selling out thing is a real true reflection of like the reach you have as an artist itself, especially in dance music. I think it's a little bit fugazi. I think it's somewhat engineered, um, in my opinion, personally, from what I can see on it. It just looks a little bit fake. Um, I don't know if that's true or if that is not true. So there is an element where I feel like if you just shared the opportunities a little bit more and you allowed other people to kind of get involved who weren't necessarily who didn't look like you know those people who i mentioned and were kind of maybe from different backgrounds different racial backgrounds different creeds all that malarkey i think it'll really help in terms of kind of um making this thing a little bit more interesting in it especially on the on the commercial scale because obviously the stuff happening on the underground don't get me wrong that's always going to exist but wouldn't it be nice to live in a world where everyone sort of like has access to all these amazing people that you liked as well right the people you follow on nts the people you go and listen to in warehouse raids wouldn't it be cool if all your other friends also got to hear them too and didn't think you know the only person to really give a shit about is like you know these old cruddy you know fuddy duddies that play at fucking awakens all the time that's not what represents what we're doing overall right there's more to it than just that part i guess that's what we are as a kind of community or scene it just needs to it kind of needs to kind of work itself out over time hopefully you're hoping anyway but it probably won't because you know if you're at the top the last thing you want is for things to get shooken up in it because you get paid 10 grand a gig to just you know phone it in so it definitely makes sense oh bloody hell leaking over my face oh, oh, what can you do anyway let's move on let's move on Oh yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, this is old news, but this is from this is from DraftKings. So obviously, I watched the uh, YouTube of the TikTok boxing card thingy, which was very entertaining. First off, way more entertaining than the Mayweather and the flipping what's his name Logan Paul fight that happened a week prior to that. I think right. Whoever put sort of the timing and the programming for this was a genius as well. Putting it on the week after that fight was well, a good um, way to kind of capitalize on that sort of hype and thankfully the hype kind of allowed it, it to kind of it bubbled over um to the following week with those guys and it was really good for the most part youtube has kind of sweeped i think the entire thing i found only one tiktoker basically one yeah if i'm not mistaken i forgot who the guy's name i think there was a guy that fought deji the main fight itself was a um really good as well entertaining i think obviously austin won pretty easily he was obviously the better boxer um this guy what's his name again this guy it doesn't matter who's it was it from bryce hall that one the bryce hall guy was a bit crap um he kind of just ran into the fight with his chin in the air which i've kind of known from the brief time that i did some group on classes that it's the easiest way to kind of get popped kind of walking in with your chin but it's something that you just kind of you do by second nature you kind of have to get it learn you kind of have to get it trained out of you over time to kind of keep your chin tucked in keep your hands up and stuff but when you just fight on the street that's what you tend to end up doing which is why for the most part if you're fighting somebody that's got any level of training you're definitely going to lose unless you get some sort of weapon or you you know you, you manage to kind of back them up against a wall or smash them on the floor and you know knock them out there's no way that you're winning against somebody that's got a little bit of training it's just not happening because they just step back and just keep popping you whenever you come up with your hands up you know when your face all exposed and stuff so um that was obviously a really fun main fight awesome Brin kind of won very easily i kind of think it got started maybe the third round or something but again very entertaining i think it did five it was a really good system to five two minute rounds or three minute rounds something along those kind of lines and wow man you quickly realized how it made you appreciate it may actually made you appreciate more yeah this is the thing i was thinking did i'd much rather watch a youtuber's view tiktokers boxing fight same with the kind of thing that barstool people do i forgot what it's called right i'd rather, much rather watch that than watch what this jake paul and logan paul are doing well, you know much more it's much more entertaining to watch because i think the jake paul and logan paul thing there's a l element of like people just hate them and they just want to watch it so they can eventually see them getting knocked out or losing right there's an element of that in it for them themselves it's obviously a really good thing in terms of athletically challenging themselves and obviously as a content as a kind of content machine they've both done everything and everything under the sun right in terms of vlogging and all that stuff on youtube there's nothing more that they can do they've kind of reached their ceiling so the obviously the next evolution of creating content is maybe starting to fight right they, what's everything they can do a reality tv show they can do that themselves on their channel it's not that entertaining um dating stuff again not that entertaining 
um, it's, it's already been done. So the next thing to do is obviously the fighting situation. There's a lot of stakes, you know, on it. A lot of ability to make a lot of money. Um, uh, you know, many times over, especially if you keep the hype up and you keep performing, and you just keep playing the bad guy card and whatever it may be. There's always going to be people truly in willing or hoping that you see you lose. So that makes complete sense. But in terms of just a uh, ability to gauge where you're at and to know and appreciate what the pros do this is far better to watch because you see stuff that you would obviously do yourself if you was involved in a fight but then you also get to appreciate why those guys at the top are so good because you know they'd walk through this entire card you know probably one arm strapped behind their back it's just the levels are just so you know so different and then another thing that made me realize it too watching this is like quite often when you watch a ufc card or like a boxing card you'd always hear people say oh he or she is tough 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 and it never really sat well with me because like yeah that's a prerequisite isn't it? if you're gonna get into a ring and fight another grown man for money there's gonna be an element of toughness associated with you right? you're not gonna be some pussy from what i can think of but then rolled on the deji versus um what's his face oh what's the guy's name it then made me appreciate what being tough is actually about and that mindset and why it's so important. Um, where is it? Who did he fight? He fought some kid. I think his name was like Tanner or something. Was it Tanner? No, Vinny Hacker. That's it. Vinny Hacker. So there was this fight with this guy called Vinny Hacker, right? And he had a fight with um, Deji, who I think is a brother of um, KSI, if I'm not mistaken. And in this fight, it basically was a a fight of will right of will but like who wanted who was going to break first because in terms of skill both play people both boxers weren't really that good in terms of what they could basically do in the ring maybe deji had a little bit more oomph behind his punches because he's a bit bigger dude he kind of reminded me of like a daniel cormier kind of figure he had a bit more pop behind his punches but when it comes to actually fighting skills there wasn't much to separate both of the guys but what you notice quite instantly watching the fight is that that kind of guy vinnie hacker dude he had heart. He had a big, big heart. He was willing to essentially die in that ring. And that essentially ended up breaking Deji. But what broke Deji more was the what his inability to work out and to get in any kind of physical condition that would allow him to last the prerequisite rounds that needed for him to kind of make an impact in the fight. And that was something that I didn't really account for because you take it for, as a given. You take it for granted in professional boxing, right? That people are just fit. Um, that's something, it's something that you see a lot with um, charity football matches especially when it's like a lot of regular folk right the, the football's so slow because everyone's not got the ability to run around in the hot sun chasing a ball for you know 90 plus minutes it's very difficult to do so you don't appreciate how the level of fitness can just allow people to just do stuff that they probably couldn't do if they had a little bit more weight on them or they weren't as fit in general and Deji basically had that and I think um, someone mentioned on Twitter when I mentioned it something like oh what's the quote like um fatigue or lack of fitness makes cows of men and that was very true and that's what you basically saw you saw Vinny Hanker just having the heart in order to be willing to die in the ring Deji probably noticing that in his eyes when he saw him in there him also knowing that he doesn't have the prerequisite physical conditioning to last for a long time and then that guy just basically broke his will and that's when i finally understood what breaking someone's will actually meant because obviously in the ufc or in boxing there is an element of breaking someone's will but it does feel a little bit like it's a maybe for me as a viewer it does feel like okay it's a job so if if i'm the person if i'm fighting and i know i'm losing and i want to see another uh, i want to maybe want to fight to see another day there's an element of like okay cool i can take this l now and i want to go back into gym and come back harder but obviously there's some people that'll say if you do that that's basically you admitting defeat and there's no way you can come back from that and it's not a warrior mentality blah blah blah. i know but there's some people that probably just go into it like that right just treat it as a job they collect their check they split bust it down with their coaching staff and they keep it moving but but then when you see somebody actually breaking someone's will what it actually looks like is that they're like hey maybe i don't have the previous skill needed to knock you out or to get out of this ring but i'm going to keep going until you stop right there's no way i'm going to stop i'm just going to keep going it doesn't matter you're going to have to take me out on the stretcher and that's what you saw and it was just incredible to see and again big up vinnie hacker because again he's much smaller than deji um the, like in terms of size and mass and i think a lot of that might account for a lot of the power that was popping into his punches that you can see it clearly kind of made Vinny hacker's head kind of you know pop back on his neck and shit 
um, but he kept going and eventually he got the TKO and he won I think in the third round and Deji was like crying obviously he felt a little bit ashamed that he didn't put in a good performance because maybe he actually does know that he's actually maybe a better boxer than the kid but he just wasn't prepared in terms of fitness wise to actually make any kind of noise and make it make sense but um, I, I really enjoyed him I'm not gonna lie I thought it was a really insane fight the whole card was super entertaining seeing all the rappers come out and perform for the boxers I think um, Lil Baby came out for a few people. Obviously, DDG being a hip-hop artist himself, he was obviously fighting too. He won his fight too as well. Um, it was entertaining. I'm not going to lie. It was far more entertaining than the Logan Paul versus Floyd Mayweather thing. Like, again, I'd much prefer seeing regular kids get into a ring and scrap than to see, like, you know, influencers pretending that they're, you know, fighting real people by fighting washed-up MMA artists, well, fighters and stuff, and... You know, I'm hoping fucking, you know, Tyron Woodley can do the business against Jake Paul, but I'm not really holding my breath. So, I don't know. Maybe it's just to pure entertainment-wise, I really like this. I think they, like I said, they did the music mix pretty decently. They had Sean, I mean, doing some bit of hostings as well. I thought Keem Star and what's his name? Who's the guy at the back there, the Asian good? Fuzzy Tube. I think Fuzzy Tube was really good. He's really funny. Um, way more better. I think a lot better at presenting than I imagined. Kim Sa wasn't really that great. I think he was a little bit shy, a little bit in 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 with himself, especially considering the content you see him do online. He didn't really come he didn't really come alive in front of the camera, I feel like, but I thought Fuzzy Tube was definitely a standout of his hosting skills. And yeah, overall, pretty decent card, I'm not going to lie. Um, a pretty, pretty decent card. So yeah, pick up everybody involved. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing some more of this stuff, to be honest, going forward, especially when they've got... It's a bit annoying because I don't know half these people are, so you don't really understand the the kind of, you know, why this would freak somebody out. Oh my God, I can't believe so-and-so is fighting, right? Because there's a lot of backstories attached to them and there's a lot of kind of history and stuff they've been doing online. And, you know, I'm sure the TikTok Shade Room would be a place to kind of get some information, but obviously I'm not going to do that. I'll read that. I can't be bothered, but it's still... Um, entertaining to see nonetheless it'll be probably be a decent thing if they tried to maybe do a kind of um tale of the tape thing where they kind of went through every person that kind of prior beef and sort of gave you a quick synopsis of why they hate each other why it's made such a good matchup i thought that would kind of get people a lot more invested into it it's sort of like you know um the male version of like um you know basketball wives or something right or <laughs> real housewives it's like that but with the fighting involved in it i think that would work out pretty well but overall as, an, as a spectacle very very entertaining i can't say that enough next on the list going back to stuff concerning the uk and disappointing but not surprising news has finally got confirmed the other day or a couple of days ago that not new carnival has been cancelled for a second year Obviously, it was cancelled last year due to the, you know, the start of COVID basically happening when the, uh, when the kind of, sorry, when the festival was meant to happen or the carnival was meant to happen. And now it's been confirmed at the really, at the 11th hour, it feels like, because it, it felt like there weren't really any updates and it felt like they were purposely trying to wait as long as they could to ensure, to see if they could kind of squeeze it in and, you know, but it just didn't work out in the end. And I kind of saw the, you know, the wood before the trees when pride got cancelled in bright in brighton yeah brighton i think that was a good indicator that you know carnival wasn't going to happen especially when you consider the scale of what brighton pride is and the amount of people that come in from overseas i think it just wasn't going to be logical or sensible for them to do it um it's disappointing again because i'm a big believer especially if it's outdoors i don't see the need why it can't occur especially when people are going nowadays with the euros people are standing outside of flipping you know um standing in the street in soho and stuff and you know watching games through flipping bar windows and just getting larry and stuff and going really mental it's the same population density of people out there but i guess if you're if you're the government you're mostly concerned about people from overseas coming in and then messing up the numbers but i don't know man i'm just i'm just a bit skeptical about the whole cancellation of these sort of things it just makes me kind of more convinced that it's more so like a Tory government thing them just being you know unwilling to reach any kind of compromise or bend or meet in the middle ground with anybody associated with parties or dance music in any way shape or form it seems like they have they've kind of declared like a silent war against it and it felt like Covid was a perfect excuse to kind of get a few people out of here and it? it feels like for that government but anyway what do I know it goes here 
No No Carnival has been cancelled for second year running. It says 2020 marked the first time there was no 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 Carnival since the street party began in 1966. I didn't even know it was that long. Jesus. With the event being held online. Um, da, 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 according to the organisers, plans for the 2021 edition would not be on the streets, but other events would that allow people to safely celebrate everything are being organised. So what? Maybe it's not going to be what we had maybe they're going to do some sort of like because if the july thing goes forward then they could do some sort of um kind of a thing in clubs i guess where you kind of hop in and hop out of different places and they have people different sound systems taking over certain clubs or all that i'm lucky i can imagine that happening it says this has been an extremely difficult decision to make everyone involved in the event desperately wants to return to the road where carnival belongs but safety has come to first and the last cautious sorry the least cautious sorry the latest cautious announcements on the government's roadmap this is the only way to ensure that but imagine how insane that is right so most likely carnival on the road is cancelled cool but more likely than not, there's going to be <sighs> lows. Calvin Klein, new LGBTQ campaign. Jesus Christ, man. Um, I hope this doesn't happen to Juneteenth. I hope Juneteenth doesn't go the way of, you know, um, flipping gay pride has, man, because they have turned that into a money-making machine. It might as well just be Black Friday, innit? They stripped away any kind of relevance or importance that that might have had to that particular community of people and just turned it into a money-making or kind of political just kind of political sort of like theater right play acting where everyone kind of changes their profile picture to something incorporating rainbows so they can pretend that they're woke it's like ugh, horrible Anyway, continues here. So in the making decision, we have this considered our responsibilities to de deliver a safe, spectacular, successful, and sustainable carnival. The conclusion is that with so many uncertainties, with time short for carnivals, leasters to prepare, and the risk of the eventual cancellation, a real possibility we must refocus for 2021. Oh, sorry, for 2021. Uh, for probably next year, I think. So the interesting thing I was going to make point here was that more more likely than not, the the street ones is not going to go on. Obviously, we know that now. But they're probably going to do stuff in clubs, right? They're probably going to do something, I'd imagine, especially with them clubs opening in allegedly the 19th of July. There's going to be enough time in order for them to get something together. If that's the case, then doesn't that seem a bit ridiculous that you can't do a carnival outdoors where, you know, the risk of catching COVID is far less than indoors? And most clubs, for the most part, I'd imagine, especially in London, the ventilation systems are basically non-existent, which is what made the whole kind of compromising or kind of working or working around the lockdown impossible because most of these places have been built you know many many moons ago or they just haven't invested in any kind of ventilation system because you just don't need to you just you know the the ability to sweat your balls off in a club it kind of adds to the charm so there's no need to kind of improve that and now we're in a position where they're going to host them in clubs where trying to get transmissions at its highest it's like this stuff is all so nonsensical. It continues here. It says, in the making decision, we have considered all. Okay, I read already earlier this year. It was warned that the social distancing measures would make the event difficult. While organizer Matthew Phillips saying it would be very difficult to hold the carnival in the traditional format on the streets, which was distancing in place, it will be devastating for a second year in a row. And here's obviously the official statement. The official date is 29 of August, the 30th of August. Like I said, there's enough time for them to put something together in clubs and kind of make up um for it but again if carnival is on the streets it's not really carnival really so it kind of takes away from it you can you can you can go to a bashment night or a reggae night or a soaking night any other week you know in london especially what makes carnival carnival is the fact that you get to do it outdoors you know drinking eating hanging out with friends and stuff having a bit of a boogie with some strangers that kind of all adds to it so without that it kind of makes it a bit pointless really but you know here we are here we are no one's again no pushback no one's really fighting against it because there's nothing you can really do to fight against it and we just truck on and hope for a better 2022 okay let's move on what we have here oh we've got this news courtesy of hype beast it looks like the dunks is not going to end anytime soon my kind of you know much maligned shoe the one that i kind of don't understand the hype about and i think is pretty shit it's still going like you're kind of going to squeeze this thing completely dry of all its juices no matter what this is courtesy of high beast and again this is a leak so we don't know if it's actually legit but it says here check out supreme and nike dunk sb by any means necessary sample the by any means necessary uh, kind of you know motif on it looks pretty cool right 
uh, was that No Love, New York? I don't know what that means, but it's um, a fairly decent colorway, you know, black and white. You can't really go wrong, especially with the color blocking. You've got the by many means there. You've got the No embroidered, it feels like on the side, and the heart embroidered, which is nice. The by any means is kind of screen printed, it looks like, right? So that's a screen print. They've got the soup on the tongue there, label. And it looks like it's pre on the back of one of the bits there on the back tab. So there's a lot of branding on it for people that like that kind of thing. Okay, Supreme Team Britain. And they're the same thing that you might see on some of the jackets that they kind of embroidered on the sleeve. So a lot of kind of cool little nods and prods here and there. I'm sure there's going to be loads of other colorways that they're going to drop um, in line with these. It kind of feels like to me like a Co.jp colorway that they've kind of pulled from the archive and basically made their own. It looks tiny, isn't it? Or is the guy's hand really big? They look like a size five or something, maybe smaller. I wonder if they're real or not. I don't know. They look real to me. Looks a bit random and it kind of fits in with Nike's, you know, decision to absolutely blow the market full of flipping or flood the market full of flipping dunks. Um, so, yeah, these are probably going to eventually come out again. Not for me. Don't care about the dunk shoes or model. Don't care about this in general. It'll probably end up going for a bit of a bit of a, a bit of bucks when they hit the resale okay there's not much images to say after the images leaked um there was some debate of whether this style was indeed the sb or dunk it looks like a regular dunk to me it doesn't look like a sb um it says here or if it was a nike sportswear dunk hire however according to a leaked sneaker instagram account they originally posted a photo the style does feature sb insole and has sb branding somewhere else on the shoe of note is the supreme has only made one non sb dunk before unreleased in 2017 okay so it makes sense then because they are part of nike skateboarding but there was a time when i think they stopped it now but if i'm not mistaken there was a time when dunk highs sbs had puffier tongues obviously i know the dunk lows do but they obviously must have changed it recently. I guess maybe with some wear testings, they found out that, you know, there's no need to have a puffy tongue if you've got a high top. It's mostly important if you've got a low top because it helps to kind of keep your foot centered. I imagine, eh, I don't know, maybe I'm making it up, who knows. But yeah, man, it's like, they're going to absolutely rinse these shoes, isn't it? There's no real end. It's just not going to stop. And like I said in another show, it's like, supposedly the 40th anniversary of dunk is coming up soon i think maybe five or so years or three years i don't know soon around the corner and they're already doing all this now and they're gonna they're gonna do it again with no real kind of feeling as if like they've exhausted the market so this is why it makes me it really interests me when you know i had my time when i was a really avid sneakerhead and i had over like 300 shoes stacked up in my room and stuff and i used to resell a bunch and buy more and do all this sort of stuff and work in shoe shops and i was obsessed with going to different stores and hanging out outside on the benches and all that malarkey right that was my life for a long period of time but then it just got boring in it it's just you know as most things you just kind of get over it you know you're just you you're into it don't get me wrong so i still buy the odd i still probably buy more shoes than the average person but in terms of caring and crying about things i don't get it's not really that bothering because you know i've had a long history of getting stuff that i wanted and maybe now because i'm not you know as well connected as i was prior and i don't have the not contacts i did back in those days and i'm unwilling to hit anybody up for anything it probably you know stops my ability to get the shoes and obviously the way that they release them makes it a bit difficult but in general i throw my hat into a raffle which you obviously have to pay for and try and get something and if i don't i don't i just keep it moving but i'm not making extra effort to go cop the shoe i'm not going to call up you know random mom and pop stores across america or parts in europe or drive to somewhere to i'm not doing that it's just not worth it and um it just doesn't excite me as much as it sh did in the past because again i've been in this for a long time and you know other things are taking priority so it's always impressive when i see people and it turns back to the 40th anniversary thing so imagine right they're already flooding the market with these dunks everyone's getting excited everyone's got their you know everyone's got a boner and then in a few years times or maybe a couple of years time is going to be the 40th anniversary and for sure nike are going to do an even bigger celebration for that right or maybe something on the same scale to mark that anniversary because nike always mark the anniversaries or stuff even if it comes a year later and they're gonna do it all over again. More collaborations, more releases, more things. It's just like, it never stops. So it's hard to see, it's hard to kind of rationalize why people get disappointed. Maybe back in my day, it was a lot more, you could have a reason to be disappointed because you generally wasn't sure if you're gonna get the shoe or not. 
but now with StockX and all these other reselling platforms and people generally buying shoes just to flip there's always a brand new dead sock pair of the shoe that you want in your size out there if you're willing to pay always when i was buying stuff you didn't even know if it was existed you had no idea if it even was available to purchase because it's just you know you didn't know now there is always there's always avenues to kind of get your shoes it just I don't know if I was Nike, I'd be a little bit more protective of, especially these sort of like legacy models, legacy, whatever they're called, right? These sort of like pressed fundamental, I don't know, whatever. These models that played a huge part in Nike's history, you'd be a little more protective of them. You wouldn't want to tire out the consumer with them. You want to kind of hold them up in the scene that you think, because obviously people in Nike clearly think the dunk is a big deal. I don't really get it, right? Personally, especially when you think of the current landscape of stuff out there at the moment. But they obviously think it's a big deal. If it is, treat it like it's a big deal. Don't just completely whore it out. And that's what it kind of feels like, you know? Everyone gets a collaboration. Some are good. Some are mostly are bad. The releases come and go. No one cares. A few people wear them. Cool. Keep it moving. It's like, and it's over with. And the moment a new trend comes along, they'll be forgotten. And it just feels a little bit like a wasted exercise personally. But, you know again what do i know this will definitely end up living in the history books for sure because it's a supreme product but they're due to come out soon i guess you'll find out when they do come out when they come out i guess in it you'll find out when they do come out now the screen thing isn't working is it but let's just move on but yeah what can you do look at them just ugh. i don't know man i don't know let's get this up there go boom it's working out yeah okay next on the list whilst we have here ba -ba 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 -bum. oh yeah we have this in it here this is courtesy of pink news this is this is hilarious but also hilariously dumb in it because obviously you, you know who you know the you know who you're messing with when it comes to milo yunapolo so this is courtesy of pink news it says ex-gay milo yunapolo says dogs no longer bark at him and he sees it as a sign from god the grift is non and never ending in it Milo Yiannopoulos has made a bizarre claim that dogs no longer bark at him and he sees it as a sign from God that he should be ex-gay. <laughs> the far-right pundit and former Breitbart editor told Christian outlet True News on Wednesday the 2nd of June that God gave him a rather well oddly specific sign that he has been cured from being homosexual, which he goes without saying can't happen. Like, the fact that he's on a Christian TV show telling people that he's an ex-gay and they're allowed, like... Christians are just so welcoming and so nice and so kind of happy to find people along their way that have kind of recently given their life to Christ because they look at it as an opportunity to get other people in their church and obviously other people to kind of spread the message to and all that malarkey. So it makes sense in that in that sense, but it's just so scummy, isn't it? Because you just know this is a grift. Fair enough, if it does turn out to be a thing, a thing that he cured himself of, cool, live your life, but... More likely than not, knowing Milo Yiannopoulos' history of what he's done over the years, right, and the lengths that he will go at in order to make sure that his name is in the press and he's able to kind of, you know, generate clicks and, you know, um, cause controversy and get a reaction out of people, this is most likely a grift, right? Another angle that he has found in order to kind of make sure that he can keep money in his pocket, right? from having those really far right views and things and just being unnecessarily cruel and mean on social media now he's kind of pivoted to being what a christian um single guy like ex-gay like what please make it make sense please so it says continues quote here when i made my announcement about being ex-gay the first thing that happened he explained <laughs> which will make you laugh but it's true is that dogs stop barking at me <laughs> this is going to sound so stupid but it's just how i think that god reveals himself to us right this is just my experience of it i don't know man like i've had the, my fair share of dogs barking at me at times and you you know it's clear to know why it's really funny especially when dogs do it and their owners don't know why especially if they're like a you know a, a, a sort of uh what are they called an adoption or whatever you know when you get, pick up dogs from the center whatever it's called it's always funny that way because you never know the history of where that dog came from and what it's been taught in his previous home. <laughs> but I remember this is one place I worked at where they had a dog there that kind of continuously kept barking at me. It didn't matter. And I think it, obviously because I started new and I was a new person in that space, but there was a few other people that started new as well. And I was the only person that kind of got barked to. And, you know, it didn't end the best there at that place, but that could have been a sign 
that that dog was maybe kind of feeling my bad vibes or it could have just been the fact that the dog didn't like me because i was black and <laughs> which is something that you get quite often it's not really you know a big deal but to ascribe that to being gay is just like a nutty nutty thing man i wonder what people in the gay community must think of stuff like this when they read it because there probably was a time where he would but then i guess it, i'd imagine most gay people probably don't really claim him in that regard milo at the time when he was gay so it's probably no loss for them but what a just ridiculous thing to say in it like just imagine god almighty he says he um dogs he, oh, let's actually hear what he has to say from true news jesus christ this guy's another level when i made my announcement the first thing that happened which will make you laugh, but it's true, is dogs stopped barking at me. I am one of those people. You know, everyone's got that friend that dogs always go nuts around. You're familiar with this, right? You, you got pets? Yes. Yeah. Right. There's always somebody that no, dogs... My, my dog doesn't bark at you. I, I keep my dog in the... But hey, dog barked at you, but that's okay. okay. Uh, he like uh, he, barks, well, he so, barks sound, people. You must have some work left to do. Um, but he didn't <laughs> bark at me. That is true. <laughs> but, but I was always one of those... I know this sounds so stupid, but this is just how I... So what is is that he's like straight trim now? He's got no more pearls and nail varnish and I don't know, makeup. That's his straight perm. He's got like a bit of a beard and like a weird sort of like faux mohawky thing going on, like, oh yeah, yeah. What a mess. I think that God reveals himself to us, right? This is this is just my experience of it. I was somebody who invariably, without exception, always used to make dogs go crazy. So we have a friend who's a political candidate down here, right? And her campaign manager has two of these little yappy dogs. And they would not stop. I couldn't be in her house for more than 20 minutes because it would drive everybody crazy. Um, even growing up, we had Alsatians, we had black Labradors. Um, they just didn't like me at all. But dogs don't bark at me anymore. And it happened almost overnight. Now they seem mm. to quite like me. And that sounds like the stupid. I don't know man what a career to have in it what a career where you're having to consistently think of other things to pivot on and then you decide to do this it's just look who knows man maybe it's true um what do you say here let's continue here my lap just lobbed a sodomy ring into the ocean for some reason my has declared that he was sodomy free in march and announced plans to open a conversion therapy clinic in florida to make it clear that he has cut ties to the LGBT community, he lobbied, he lobbed a so-called sodomy stone, an engagement ring, into the Pacific Ocean. The more I looked at this gigantic four-carat money pit, the more I thought that this is a perfect example of some of the lies I bought into my previous life. Oh yeah, because he was married, isn't it? Right, some black guy supposedly. Spare a thought for him, man. What heartbreak! But I guess you know, again, it's, it's better to move on for somebody like this than to be in a relationship and just be, you know, pretending everything's okay. Because this guy is a nutter. He said, for instance, the lie that I could be in a rabid culture warrior for the right and a sodomite at the same time. I can't. Minneapolis is once a soaring uh, torchbearer of the modern far right, only for his fire to be doused repeatedly by scandal to scandal, such as his career, for example, which tanked when it emerged that he had never actually written for Breitbart. A team of ghostwriters said, oh, really? Reputation was seemingly dragged in 2017 when he was accused of endorsing pedestrian um with comments about younger boys having sex with older men oh yeah yeah man this guy is like i guess when you have, when you're that person you just have to kind of lean into it and decide this is my life this is what i'm willing to do to make sure that i kind of keep myself in the headlines and have the ability to make money doing this sort of thing but what a betrayal to himself to the community that he alleged to be a part of like everything family members the guy he was in relationship with just so what he can be get viral again and again you're hoping this is true you're hoping this is real um sort of like when somebody has like a cheats on somebody with a, a random right or like has another family you're hoping that, that person you go with is going to end up being your forever person but more likely than not if you do that one thing it's mostly an example of your treacherous ways and other in other situations too that are going to probably come to light but jesus christ ex-gay Imagine that. And now he's on Christian TV programs declaring his uh his conversion to people and they somehow are convinced by it. I just I just don't understand. I really, really don't understand. I can't I can't I can't get it. I really can't get it. But hey, maybe I'm an idiot. Then we continue here. This is courtesy of Variety. 
let's get this up on here on the screen it says yes Spotify can share 60 million plus deal with Alex Cooper for Call Your Daddy podcast yanking away from Barstool when I saw this news my jaw hit the floor not because of the amount but because of the podcast in question because there was a period of time when obviously Call Your Daddy went through their drama a couple of years ago or a year ago I'm not sure what it was when one when obviously it was two girls Sophia and this girl called Alex and they had a bit of a passa passa, a little bit of a button of heads, which eventually led to them both splitting and then led to Alice Cooper staying at Barstool, taking the deal that Dave Portnoy gave her, um, kind of seeing how her contract, for better, lack of a better term, to kind of simplify it, um, Dave Portnoy. Because kind of, I think what was the issue at hand, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was, no, it was money, yeah, it was money. They both didn't think, which is always an issue, isn't it? This is what made it funny when Joe Biden kept telling everybody, all the fans, it's not a money thing, it's not a money thing. Yes, it is, it's always money. It's always money, it's always money. So they both felt like they were being underpaid because I guess for whatever reason, regardless of your your kind of success, I guess, under the boss or umbrella, you're all kind of paid a flat rate, I guess, salary-wise. I'm not getting, I'm, I'm not under details. But then over time, obviously, Dave Portnoy saw the value they brought to the company, the amount of merch they were moving, all this stuff. Downloads are getting plays and allegedly the downloads are comparable to what Joe Rogan gets, right? So for two girls just yapping about their sex lives to get as many downloads as joe rogan who sits down with you know some of the smartest people in the world for three plus hour conversations and this is like a heavily edited you know hour tops um podcast it definitely goes to show that they had definitely something right they had a lightning in a bowl so it's definitely a thing and then obviously they felt like they were getting underpaid they went to the negotiation table somehow within that negotiation the two girls fell out um you know i guess they had to they kind of maybe had a silent agreement that they were both going to walk away but then sophia walked alex didn't she stayed which might have seemed like a snake move i don't know but then she ended up being the small one in the decision because i think they've put on then realized hey i'm not willing to fight you on this all the time i see you guys are the ones right you got the power you got the juice so i can't hold you back so basically see out your contract and i guess he's kind of one of the best founders of all times and business partners because he was willing to basically tell them hey or tell her specifically if you see out your contract i'll give you back your ip i'll basically give you the ability to kind of take call her daddy and kind of shop it around and get a better deal for yourself just see out the contract and do right by me i'll do right by you she did right by him it feels like and then now she's got this 60 million dollar plus deal with spotify what made me my jaw hit the floor was the fact that i listened to a bit of it prior um when they were both on the show right sophia and alex and again it's not for me but then when she left and she was doing it on her own, the show dropped in quality drastically. Really, really bad. In terms of even just uploading ep new episodes, you know, it felt like everything was a chore for her. She didn't actually feel like she went to do the work, which is, I guess, a, a thing that I've kind of get, learned to um, find amusing, especially, you know, being a kind of a A-type and being all work, work, work and waking up early and doing all these mad things to so listen to podcasts especially people like red scare who kind of enjoy and revel in the idea of like not really wanting to work it's kind of funny now but back in the, back at that time i was like eh, that's not making sense why wouldn't you want to just press record and do your podcast if you're getting paid millions to do it's the easiest job in the world but you know who, who cares but 60 million dollar plus deal is just wild man congratulations to her i guess and if you're sophia you must be screaming into your pillow right now but it says here um, alice cooper and a sex positive podcast called daddy are leaving the Barho sports sorry Barho sports barstool sports coming to spotify exclusively streaming next month under a multi-year deal supposedly it's a three-year deal for 60 million Ugh. and she's allegedly getting 20 million up front she smashed it um all existing and new episodes of Call of daddy will remain free and starting from july 21st will be available on only on spotify in addition to bring in the post podcast to spotify exclusively the deal also covers all future episodes and additional exclusive projects in development with cooper which is interesting because I think that's one thing I remember Dave Portnoy saying. He didn't want to offer them. Yeah, I think he said it recently in a recent interview. He didn't want to give them because he said, he said Barstool had the financial abilities to match Spotify's deal, which I have a hard time believing, but who knows? Maybe they did have the money to do so. But it just, didn't, it just wouldn't probably make long-term business sense. So anyway, they didn't do it. But he said one reason why he didn't do it was because he didn't want to be on top of her and kind of, you know pushing for stuff to come out at a certain time and micromanaging in that respect because he's basically saying look if i'm putting 60 million into you i'm going to be a lot more hands-on and he didn't want to be hands-on he went to kind of let them be free or let her be free alice cooper which is why because he understood part of the magic was the fact that she's you know 
lazy he doesn't like doing the work but then when it finally does strike and when it finally does come uh, when the episodes do finally hit and you, you know there's nothing kind of out there like it in that regard maybe that's what he kind of felt so that makes sense the three-year agreement says that between cooper and spotify is worth more than 60 million the two sources familiar with the project said um, variety the this makes spotify's biggest exclusive deal for a woman-led podcast to date the wall street journal which first boy talks had pegged the deal at around 20 million the deal does not involve Barcel Sports, which is the home of Core Daddy since 2018. Going forward, Spotify will produce Core Her Daddy with Cooper. So definitely might see a direction, change the direction of content, what she's doing. But then the future project things are interesting. I want to see what she ends up doing there. If she ends up kind of taking on more of a senior role inside the company or whatnot. If it, or maybe it just might end up killing the podcast. You don't know. Which is probably why she they probably try to get the twenty million dollars up front, just so they can get something from this. Because if it ends up falling flat on their face, you don't want to walk away with like nothing, can it? Because it's all tied up in guarantees and whatnot. So it says here it continues. I think it's a quote from her. It says, I'm incredibly thankful for everyone who has supported, helped, and been part of Core Daddy Cooper said in a statement from its start three years ago. The show has always been about challenging the status quo and manifesting conversations that previously only happened behind closed doors. But then that's a problem though, isn't it? To call that. The whole thing about it is that if you're in a relationship and if you're not young anymore, is that kind of show even interesting? I guess it maybe is in terms of a voyeuristic point of view. You want to kind of find out what people are getting up to regardless of what their age. But part of the charm I thought about it was the fact that they were two, let's say for lack of a better term, bimbos trying to find their way in the big city and then sleeping with loads of men along the way and kind of finding themselves, right? In that regard. Um but then when you're like in a relationship and you're, or you're married and you've got kids and stuff, you can't be talking about sucking some guy's dick in the toilet anymore, can you? Because it doesn't happen. But who knows? Um, Court Daddy has consistently ranked in the top 15 podcasts across all platforms this year and was number five most listened to podcasts on Spotify in 2020. The number one podcast on Spotify last year was Joe Rogan, followed by TED Talks Daily, The New York Times, The Daily and Spotify exclusives. The Michelle LeBron podcasts are all paid for. And that Jesus is so game the system, isn't it? Which probably explains why she got so much money because if you're able to break those kind of numbers and keep in those kind of rankings without having all the kind of corporate overloaded over over all overlords sponsoring you and pumping you up and kind of inflating the numbers that means you've actually got genuine fans that means if she comes to put on a call her daddy live event she'd sell tickets do you know what i mean like there'll be in a, there'll be probably i won't say arenas maybe maybe theaters full of people willing to like sit down and watch her talk on stage for sure i'm not I, there's no way i'm i'm not believing that it says here core daddy also is the second most popular female-led podcast globally after the crime junkie hosted by ashley flowers and brit prota according to the data released in march spotify's deal locking up core daddy bring another hugely popular podcast on the stable shows um joining the Joe Rogan experience of Dak Shepard Armchair Expert coming to Spotify exclusive on July 1st um Spotify also signed exclusive deals with partners including the Obamas the Prince Harry and Meghan Markle who gives a shit and it has also acquired companies like Gimli, Anchor, Pyrocast, Megaphone as well as Ben Simmons the Ringer this also makes you think why this also kind of if anything paints Joe Budden and his kind of whole fuck up with Spotify in an even worse light if the fact that they were able to do deals with all these different people for varying amounts of money and Joe Budden wasn't able to secure a deal for himself and his friends and make them millionaires. He had to kind of, you know, take a stand or for lack of a better term, hide the books from his friends in the process and then not walk away with anything. And it would be so ironic because I think there was an image circulating on the Joe Budden podcast subreddit of allegedly Rory and Moore um, having a meeting at the Barstool Sports office. It would be so, there'd be so much kind of karmic sort of justice if like, you know, Rory and Moore's podcast ended up under the Barcelona sports umbrella and then somehow along the process they end up getting bought out or they end up kind of getting you know a deal with Spotify further down the line because they were getting crazy numbers after they did their deal with Barcelona like or they just end up getting a crazy contract from Barcelona to keep them there like that would be that would be typical in it of the universe of saying hey this is our this is our way of telling you Joe that you did you fucked up um, you'd imagine that would be pretty crazy but you never know Joe probably might end up kind of rescuing the JBP and turning that into a multi-million dollar thing all things are possible 
It says here, originally called a daddy, was hosted by Cooper and Sophia Franklin with the duo bantering in explicitly risque topics. Last year, Franklin and Cooper had a public spat with Barcelona Sports President Dave Portnoy over the terms of the contract. Portnoy, among other things, claimed to offer them a base salary of 500,000 plus bonuses and other incentives. Franklin did not sign a deal and said that she felt betrayed by Cooper after quitting the show. Franklin launched her own podcast, Sophia the F. According to Spotify, as the show has evolved, Cooper's priorities has been to uncover the importance of therapy, self-care, and personal growth from sharing her own mental health journey with her listeners, who she refers to as a daddy gang. The podcast has also spawned a successful line of merchandise. Cooper's... So, the other girl, Sophia, I guess, you obviously you're shouting into a pillow about this news, but in general, if you're not, if you didn't feel cool about the deal and you generally feel like you were being underpaid and you know maybe it is the biggest mistake in podcast history who knows but if she didn't feel right and the vibe wasn't good it, like you should just leave I, I don't know i've worked in too many environments especially offices where people kind of complain daily about their jobs but they get paid pretty well and i just don't see that as a bargain i'd willing to take spending you know half of my day every time you go out for drinks they're always moaning about the manager or their or their workload and it's like surely there's not an, surely there's kind of taken away from the uh, your kind of joy and satisfaction of earning that salary you earn if every time you think about your workplace you just get angry that kind of feeling where you're on the train to go to work and you're really fed up before you even stepped your foot in there it just isn't worth it so maybe she walked away from a big check she walked away from you know a possibility of making millions and millions but she might be happier now personally um she obviously has her own thing going on and people kind of enjoy so if you were there if i listened to a couple of episodes the other day and it was fairly enjoyable again not obviously made specifically for me in mind but definitely you can see she knows what she's doing so if that's the case and they both were able to kind of obviously dave portno kept saying that you know alex cooper was the one the genius behind the brand but they've obviously both got something in terms of media and in terms of presenting themselves on social media and on, on socials and in that sense you know i could still see a scenario where she could come back and do something on her own regard that could catch the public consciousness and become a cultural viral hit in that regard and i don't necessarily think it's a bad thing all, all along i don't think it's a bad thing at all it continues cooper's guests on call daddy have included mia khalifa Malay cyrus ricky thompson the topics on the show have included reclaiming your power after experiencing trauma sexual fluidity self-love debunking mental health stigmas this is probably everything that you wouldn't want to hear at a house party in it you probably want to make you leave the or it probably it's the kind of topics that would kind of get you chucked out of certain groups at a house party if you had the wrong opinions in it oh it's a dude this isn't the topics that you want to hear about you continue to we'd be on excited to welcome to a third level and few thousand bus for listeners generated after each episode is emblematic of the magic of the podcast and it's connects with a millennial and gen z generations while empowering her audience to openly express themselves creepers and replied the uta which brokered a deal with spotify alongside law firm jansen jacobs handsome jacob sorry but jesus man congrats to her man 60 million for for in my opinion a podcast that kind of feels like it was on the on its last legs it wasn't really you know it was kind of trudging along and she's been able to kind of revive it get a deal out of it and again it goes to show numbers really do count stats do matter in that respect whoever's getting the most downloads and listens and views would eventually be able to kind of write their own ticket write their own check and she's basically gone ahead and done that and you can't hit on that man so congrats to her let's see wagwan in it let's see wagwan what else have i got here what time is that so far on 12 let's continue we got one more what's gonna talk about here i think that might be it for now you know the, 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 yeah let's leave it for there for now i think that might be let's let's do that for now and then we'll come back on the other side so that is episode number 467 of the extensive show festival for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if it's the first time check out the show for youtube you know what to do smash that like button hit subscribe and even comment down below if you're listening for the podcast that a five star review and a share will help the show to go a long way and until then i'll see you guys very very soon take care peace